Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome My name to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr. I am the Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. We're very pleased to have all of you here today, and we'd like to welcome our presenters, Jillian Ainsworth and Sebastian Villasante of the University of Santiago de Compostela. They're going to be speaking today about the role of marine protected areas in providing ecosystem services to improve ocean and human health. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how you can ask questions during the webinar. So um, Jill and Sebastian will be presenting for about 40 minutes or so, and we're we'll, going to be holding the remaining time for, for a question and answer. Um, to ask a question, and you can send in your questions at any point during the webinar, even during the presentation, you can post it to the question and answer portion of the Zoom interface, or you can post it in the chat. With the chat, you have the option of sending things, uh, messages and questions just to the hosts and panelists, um, or you can send it, to make it available to all the attendees. Um, in addition, in the chat, we would welcome you posting relevant resources and questions and comments and input experiences uh, in the chat, and you're welcome to share with all attendees. We just ask if you're going to use that option to please keep it professional uh, and on this topic. Um, so thank you everyone for being here, and I will turn it over to Jill and Sebastian now. Well, th thank you very much, Sara, for the kind presentations, and everyone for joining us in this, let's say, conversation. And uh, my name is Sebastian Villasante, as uh, Sara already said, and well, I, um, with my colleague Jill Iceberg, both from the Equal Sea Lab, we will be sharing our some reflections inside about the role of uh, MPAs uh, with some examples and some uh, reflections that we, we are doing during the last uh, couple of, of years. Uh, I am sharing the presentation. We prepared the presentation for about 35, 40 minutes, so we can also have some uh, discussions, uh, conversation around this uh, very exciting topic. Um, well, uh, I will be uh, starting in, in the in the first part of the presentation, and then my colleague uh, Jill will be also uh, continuing with the presentation as well. Um, so, well, the role of marine protect areas uh, and uh, on how this could uh, improve ecosystem services to improve both ocean and human health. This is something that we usually uh, do not see it both in in the uh, scientific papers on the literature to in the policy documents and we all several colleagues around the world we are also trying to push the agenda in terms of the research and empirical evidence in order to try to really link both the importance of uh, marine protect area to well recover or to improve marine ecosystems and also ecosystem services or nature contribution to people that they provide but also the importance of human health uh, that people could also benefit from uh, the marine protect areas. So just a very brief introduction. Uh, we are, uh, Jill and I, we are from the Equal Sea Lab. The Equal Sea Lab is a new and young and interdisciplinary um, uh, research lab based here in Santiago de Compostela in the Northwest of Spain, in which we basically work in the topic of equity, justice, and also uh, sustainability transformations around the world with the topic of marine protect areas as one of the important uh, tools or fisheries management for marine conservation. Uh, it is funded by the European Research Council uh, for a consolidated grant and also from other uh, donors. Um, well, this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, very briefly, we would like to share with you some insights and, uh, and thoughts about the status of the oceans, the role of blue food, how we can really combine and conciliate uh, the importance of uh, recovering fish stocks and at the same time uh, providing food and other ecosystem services to people. What is the role of marine ecosystem services to both uh, benefit oceans and people. Uh, also, we will uh, also talk a little bit um, about the advance 
um, uh, in, the, in, in the sense of how community and international organizations and government has been uh, moving from a, 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 an initial, let's say, anthropogenic perspective on how we can measure or value ecosystem services or nature contribution to be to, to more holistic, pluralistic, um, a, um, uh, um, diverse uh, consideration of values that nature provides to us. Then we will be also sharing some just as illustrated examples, some of them that has been already uh, implemented by using marine protect areas, as well as other examples that we are currently working both here in Europe and also uh, in the rest of the Atlantic Ocean. That is, there are several projects that we are uh, conducting right now here in Europe, but applied, uh, for example, in Africa, as well as in South America and Latin America. Well, just to start with very uh, basic information that most of you are, uh, I am sure that you are familiar with. Uh, well, uh, usually we live, uh, uh, let's, uh, in, in general, people, we, we do not care uh, much about the oceans, except that people live or work very close to the oceans. But basically the oceans, uh, well, we know that they really provide a very important a, a role in order to, to maintain or to support or to generate life on Earth and human well-being. Uh, and the, uh, the oceans are all, all also able to provide us not only food, fuel, fiber, but also other type of diverse and multiple ecosystem services like, like they are very important to uh, not only our uh, well-being in terms of people, but also to develop economic activities in the oceans, right? And, and also to maintain and to regulate the climate as well as other key ecosystem services like, for example, recreation, coastal protection, or cultural ecosystem services. Um, although this important role of the oceans, uh, well, the, we know uh, based on different global assessment, international organizations, IPPC, IPVS, uh, that, well, the, the oceans are in trouble, right? Uh, there are uh, multiple um, activities based on human pressure that they are pushing or, or putting at risk uh, the ability of the ocean to provide as uh, different ecosystem services. This is just one example, right? That I'm, I'm sure that you, you know very well. Uh, this is the first uh, global assessment of the IPVS published in 2019. And basically, while well, highlighting that uh, the, there is in general a global decline of nature and biodiversity loss around the planet, right? Of course, this, is, this can be different or diverse uh, in terms of geographical areas and habitat or ecosystems, right? But in general, uh, while well, the natural ecosystem might decline by almost 50% during the last decades, right? Uh, and basically because of the direct drivers and the land sea and the uh, use change, climate change, pollution and invasive species are the main direct drivers as well as other indirect drivers like uh, uh, the IPVS global assessment already highlighted. Um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, more, let's say, uh, moving from abroad, from a general perspective to a more specific one, well, this is also one of the key uh, figures that the IPVS already published in that assessment, which show us, well, more or less the current state of uh, ex extinction risks in different species groups. And, and in this webinar, we would also like to share with you, well, some reflection systems that, uh, of course, there is a, an important decline of uh, most of the ecosystem in the world, but at the same time, there are some species like especially those that they are here in the oceans of course this is at global level and depending on the availability of information that well some of them like for example bony fish or crustaceans well there are some uh, uh, type of uh, species or group of species that they are in a not very bad situation compared to other type of species right uh, we cannot the same uh, we can uh, um, uh, say the same we cannot say the same for sharks and rays and corals, of course, right? We, which are very sensitive and, and declining over time, right? And again, this is a global perspective, and this is, of course, the, well, quite different depending on the uh, on the areas and, and on the place that you usually or we usually work. Another um, important uh, background consideration is uh, that uh, well, marine protect areas usually has been a 
probably one of the most important uh, tools for marine conservation to try to recover marine ecosystems. And this is also reflected in the fact that the demand of seafood has been increasing exponentially since the Second World War, right? In, in, even some uh, colleagues, some, some scholars are also talking about what we know as a blue acceleration, right? Uh, an increased expansion of human activities in the ocean, in this case of fisheries, not all, of, especially industrial fisheries, to really try to supply uh, seafood markets and increase the demand of the human population over the last decades. And we can see basically two general trends. The first one is an, 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 uh, one, an important increase uh, until right now, almost uh, 190 uh, million of tons. This is uh, the figure based on the uh, last report published by the FAO, the SOFIA report that has been launched uh, last week. Uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, in blue line, we can see that there is, a, in terms of marine capture fisheries, there is a, a, a plateau, there is a, a stabilization of the catch even during uh, since uh, the mid of the 19th until now. So this is uh, saying something uh, important, which is that the uh, human demand for seafood products are increasing, that mainly is being supplied or complemented by uh, by the aquaculture products, but in terms of marine capture fisheries, uh, well, this is this is suggesting that we have a problem in terms of because of overfishing, because of the lack of success or effective fisheries management system, or even because other type of uh, uh, um, protective measures like potentially marine protected areas are in combination of all other fisheries management system probably are not. Uh, working so well as we expected, right? So we are like, uh, you know, experience this uh, stabilization of the marine fisheries catch. Um, but this is, I would say, the state of the ocean, right? Very uh, briefly to, to share with you some very key uh, figures about what is happening. But on the other side, we also know that the blue food that is uh, uh, fish, crustaceans, mollusks, or cephalopods, so species that we extract from the ocean and we we eat are very important for uh, food security, food nutrition, uh, that pr they provide us micronutrients like vitamin A, zinc, selenium, and so on, uh, that they are really uh, key for the uh, human health of the population in the planet. Uh, and uh, the capacity of the blue food to feed humanity uh, can be uh, supported by the fact that, for example, there are some studies that are already highlighting uh, the bringing together almost 3,000 of species together, not only terrestrial, but also uh, aquatic species. And this is just uh, in this uh, in this figure, we can see that those uh, species highlighted in blue are those who uh, belong to the aquatic uh, species or the aquatic group of species in the planet. And we see that in terms of the nutritional value of the species, both combining terrestrial and aquatic, we see that the most important one that they are in the top are especially from the ocean. So the oceans has the capacity to provide uh, uh, a, 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 to 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 yeah to provide a very important role in terms of uh, uh, providing us nutritional values to ensure our uh, human health uh, in the planet, right? So we have this some sort of uh, two coins of the of the um, of the challenge in terms of the marine protected areas is on the one hand we need to recover marine ecosystems, but at the same time we have the capacity to the oceans to really provide us key micronutrients that they are essential to uh, not only to provide us healthy diets, but also to reducing uh, potential chronic diseases like of, uh, of malnutrition, obesity, and hypertension, and even certain types of cancers. Um, now let's try to start focusing a little bit on uh, a very background information about marine protected areas that I am sure most of you are very uh, aware of. Uh, well, there is uh, 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 around uh, more than uh, 70,000 MPAs around the world approximately, and there is uh, uh, different international conventions or uh, uh, instruments like the UN uh, SDGs, uh, Objective uh, 14, or the SBD, H Target 11, or the last uh, global biodiversity framework that they are advocating to increase 
the space in the planet or in the ocean to really achieve the 30 for ter for terce. It achieves to achieve by 20, uh, 30 the capacity of the countries to really protect their ocean until 30%. This is the main objective in the planet, right? Uh, and on the other hand, we can see this, that uh, of course there is a, some sort of mosaic of situations in terms of the both the combination of the states of this plan of the establishment or implementation of the marine protect areas from committed, designated, implemented, and actively managed on the one hand, and on the other hand, the level of protection, right? From the low protection to fully protection, allowing or not fishing activities or other type of activities. And this is really important because sometimes when uh, people are discussing about the role of marine protect areas, well, uh, there is there are very well intentioned uh, um, design of marine protect areas, but sometimes some of some marine protect areas could not fully be implemented or not fully are able to provide the expected benefit in relation to how uh, they are actively managed or effectively uh, uh, um, uh, managed in order to uh, to sustainably manage the the ecosystems that they depend on on these marine protect areas. Um, and this, uh, well, considering this, uh, well, in this uh, book that uh, is uh, about human oceans and human health, well, in our chapter, in chapter two, uh, we, several colleagues uh, around the world, not only here in Europe, but also uh, in, in Canada, for example, that we are working in different fields on uh, uh, recreational fisheries, coastal fisheries, industrial fisheries, and also aquaculture, we join together and try to reflect on how will be the role of marine protect areas. And well, you can, if you are interested to, uh, to read more detail, not only our chapter, but also the collection of other uh, chapters as well, uh, that they talk about the overview of, human, of the oceans and the human health, the ocean benefits, the risks, the negative anthropogenic or human impact, and how we can really um, generate powerful uh, and impactful uh, solutions from both the uh, public and the private sector. Um, given say that, uh, I will also like to uh, uh, start talking about the second part of, of the structure of the outline of the presentation, which is trying to disentangle the values of nature, right? Um, and uh, well, in general, when we talk about uh, values and uh, an importance of uh, of marine protect areas or species that they are usually located uh, localized in those protect areas, well, people usually have different perceptions or different opinions, and even even multiple values toward both species and and protected areas, right? <clears throat> and here we would like to share with you, well, basically, the current, let's say, in a very simplified way. The current state of the art, which is basically uh, the, the the type of the values and several examples uh, in terms of uh, what nature, or in this case, what oceans provides to people in terms of instrumental, intrinsic, or relational values, how we relate to the oceans and how marine protect areas specifically could potentially provide us different examples of different intrinsic, instrumental, and relational values. And this is basically the framework that has been developed by the IPVS uh, community, in which, uh, well, they, they, we we were uh, moving in the in the uh, in the scientific communities uh, from uh, a more instrumental way uh, to uh, to uh, to basically use economic uh, uh, metrics or indicators to really try to monetize or try to estimate the economic benefits of. The oceans or on the on um, on the uh, of uh, from marine protect areas, we move from that to a more range, a more holistic, pluralistic, and inclusive values to try to not only, of course, the importance to consider the uh, the economic contribution or benefit from a given marine protect area, but also other type of benefits or or values that these areas are potentially able to to provide us, like for example, emotional health way of life, sense of place, or social cohesion, among others. Uh, and this is uh, why, uh, well, uh, the, the importance of, uh, in our view, the importance and the needs to consider when not only creating marine protect areas, but also implementing and effectively managing, uh, we think that it's important to, well, to, to try to find uh, a balance between not only biodiversity conservation in terms of recovering a marine ecosystem, but also 
well, who benefit and who harm from uh, the implementation and the creation of marine protect areas, right? And, uh, and we know that sometimes can be challenging and there is a trade-off and synergies um, and dyna dynamics over space and time about these two, let's say, objectives, I will say, or targets, but this is important to really consider, right? To, uh, to basically to unpack uh, the real uh, potential of marine protect areas in the oceans, right? Um, well, uh, now uh, I will start, uh, well, just sharing with you some of the examples uh, that we have been, uh, or we have experienced, or we have been working, or we are currently working, that also my colleague Jill will be also uh, sharing with you in more detail. Um, this is just one example. This is the Marine Protect Area of Fish and Interest of Miniarsos here in Galicia, where we live and where we usually work. This is in the Northwest of Spain. And this uh, uh, marine protect area basically is marine protect area of fishing interest, which means that fishing activities are allowed, but of course, uh, really controlled by a co-management system that is usually developed by fishers, uh, officers from the administration, scientists, and NGOs. And this marine protect area has been especially uh, driven and, and promoted by the fishers itself, small scale fisheries that has been severely impacted by the prestige oil spill in 2002 in, in Galicia. And after five years in 2007 of this, having discussions, mapping the habitats, how this has been, uh, how the prestige has been uh, affected the different species, not only in terms of uh, uh, ecological aspect, but also in terms of the recovery of species. So this allowed the fisheries uh, uh, sector as well as scientists and administration to really uh, have a deep conversation and a deep awareness about the importance of this particular area and the importance of how this uh, small fishing community uh, uh, that depends on, uh, on this uh, area that has been affected by the prestige oil spill would have the capacity to really recover and to find a practical solution, uh, trying to deal with this huge shock, right? And uh, basically, well, the fishing community uh, were able to promote, to design, and to localize a specific uh, zones in which the the, uh, the habitat and the nursery of the key species needs to be recovered. This has been approved by uh, a, a decree here in Galicia and Spain by two thousand and seven, and since then. While well, the fisheries and ecological knowledge were able to also contribute to manage the species, not only by you know by doing uh, 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 surveys in, into the into the oceans to see into the marine protect area in order to really see uh, the state of the species, but also uh, combining the scientific assessment with the fishers' uh, ecological knowledge, right? And this is really important to complement and to have this source of knowledge and multiple ways to try to generate evidence and, and information about the status of the species. The other important thing is that uh, this co-management system is basically uh, developed by a different type of factors, as already said, and the consensus is the main criteria for decision making. Right. This is not the, the administration that is taking the decision or the fish is only taking the decision, right? This is a co-production uh, of knowledge and a, a, a decision that is taken uh, by the, these different actors within the management plan that uh, every year uh, the marine protect areas and the regional government usually adapt for the different species into the marine protect area. And, uh, well, just uh, to share with you the main outcomes of, of, of this uh, marine protect area. Uh, of course, as uh, as always, as, uh, this is not the panacea. Of course, this is uh, uh, not this example, but other uh, protected areas or other, uh, let's say, fisheries management tool, uh, uh, of course, has uh, challenge or limitations. But the, uh, starting from a really short or really um, a low number of fishers, right, right now there are about 80 fishing vessels approximately from different short or small coastal communities, as you can see in the top of the uh, of this uh, photo on the right of the slide. Uh, more than uh, 70 years after the implementation, the marine protect area has really generated positive effect on several important elements that they are critical to really 
change the way, not only the practices, but also the out the structures in terms of the internal governance of the marine protect area, as well as the outcomes that is, uh, that is able the, the area to really deliver, not only uh, in terms of the protection or the conservation of, of marine species, but also in terms of economic revenues and employment that is generated by the area, right? And also uh, important thing is that uh, starting from the fragmented sector, when the uh, uh, prestige oil spill has been severely and uh, heavily affected the area, uh, we started from the fragmented sectors in which there are different opinions and, and even diversion or, or contradictory position between the fishes, uh, well, the area and this model of co-management system were able to really develop uh, some sort of model of trust and cooperation between the actors. Of course, there are discussions and there are disagreements, but mainly the main direction of from the last, let, let's say, almost two decades is that this is a good example, not only for these particular protected areas, but also because of this example has been also inspired the FAO voluntary guideline for small scale fisheries, but also, for example, uh, the uh, uh, the small scale fisheries law in Catalonia, which is an example of so also sustainable and successful law, not only in Spain, but also in Europe. And also this example serve, this small example from the Northwest of Spain also serve as an example to create the new network of small scale fisheries based on this and inspired on this model in different Iberoamerican countries, not only Spain and Portugal, but also several, uh, uh, several uh, um, uh, uh, countries in, in, in Iberoamerica, which, which involve right now almost 20 million uh, fishers. And uh, with this, uh, I pass the floor to my colleagues. Jill, please. Thank you, Sebastian, uh, for that very interesting introduction. And um, I'm now going to move on to talk about two other case studies. And these are operating at different geographic scales. And they're also very different to the one that Sebastian has just described. So these give... Um, additional examples of how to incorporate plural values into decision-making. But first of all, I'd like to ask you a question, and I wonder whether uh, the answers that you might come up with would be perhaps have some similarities to them, but maybe also some differences. And it, it might be quite fun if you would like to post your response into the chat. Uh, maybe we could see later on what kinds of answers are coming out. Um, what do you think is a, a, a healthy ocean? And how do you measure ocean health? Is, is a healthy ocean one that should exclude human pressures? Is that even possible? Um, next slide, please, Sebastian. And the interesting thing is that up until very recently, uh, policymakers have been trying to develop policies to achieve healthy oceans without really having an integrated tool or an effective tool to be able to measure its health or to understand what a healthy ocean should look like, and, and also what a healthy ocean looks like to different kinds of stakeholders, because that could be very different things. And that's very important to understand for inclusivity. And next slide, please. And so there's a need to change what we've been doing in business as usual, and we need to understand what the various indicators are, the ecological indicators and social indicators that need to be measured within uh, ocean assessments and marine protected area assessments to understand uh, what needs to be adapted and how progress is, uh, is advancing. And we need to be able to evaluate the cumulative pressures and resilience that are impacting on our, our oceans and also the impacts of one sector over others. So there's a very complex arena in which we're working and uh, this can be um, very tricky to, to try to understand, but there has been um, some work in this area and um, there is a, a, now a tool that's available that can help us to better understand how to measure and integrate each of these different elements. Next slide, please. And so in 2012, uh, the Ocean Health Index was uh, released and was first trialled at a global level by colleagues uh, Ben Halpern. And, and um, this tool is a way to assess the health and the benefits of the global ocean. And since 2012, the global assessment has been run on an annual basis. 
but also there are uh, regional assessments which are being conducted at um, varying geographic scales. So for example, at a country level, but also at a, a more a smaller regional level within countries. And so there's a lot of interesting information that's coming out of these tools, which are uh, this tool which is helping us to be able to understand which are the strongest impacts in certain areas and also the interactions between these impacts. Next slide, please. And so according to the uh, developers of the Ocean Health Index, a healthy ocean to them is a is a one that sustainably delivers a range of benefits to people both now and in the future. And next slide, please. So the Ocean Health Index incorporates 10 different goals, and these are 10 goals which represent the benefits that the ocean provides to humans. And so these incorporate various different uh, elements of the ocean from food provisioning, artisanal fishing opportunities, natural products, carbon storage, coastal protection, livelihoods and economies, tourism and recreation, sense of place, clean waters, and biodiversity. And within each of these goals, it's possible to collect data, which has already been published. And this is how this tool works, is that uh, it's completely open access and uses data that's already uh, available um, and uh, uh, uses this data to understand what are the most recent trends over the last five years it, within a particular goal, so using specific data. And then that's used to understand what could be the future trend for a particular goal. And <clears throat> excuse me, once the uh, the data has been gathered for a goal and the assessment is completed, then a score is allocated to each goal. And th so the score is out of 100, but 100 doesn't mean that, um, for example, the, the state of biodiversity in a particular area that's being assessed is perfect or pristine. It's according to a reference point. So uh, for example, with um, sense of place is the goal which includes marine protected areas um, as one of the, the indicators. And the, the reference point for, for that is 30% in, in Europe, a common uh, indicator and reference point is 30% of the coastline is protected. So if a goal, if the goal of um, sense of place was uh, accorded 100 points, then that would mean that 30% of the coastline was protected. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the coastline is uh, completely healthy. So it's an indicator. It's a way of being able to understand um, a status and to um, develop shared goals and aspirations and then be able to work on those to uh, advance the particular goals that that um, stakeholders have for the area. Uh, next slide, please. And so as, um, within the Equal Sea Lab, uh, we're working in a project called Atlanteco, which aims to understand the Atlantic Ocean and uh, there are um, 30 or 40 different partners uh, working with us and on various different things and um, focusing on the microbiome and looking at five different ecosystem services in particular through three research pillars. And these involve the microbiome, plastics and the plastosphere, and the seascape for ocean connectivity. And within our lab, uh, we're working on uh, the social science aspects of understanding the Atlantic. And in particular, one strand of this is to understand the links between ocean health and sociocultural values. So the next two case studies that I'm going to explain uh, involve the Ocean Health Index, and but, else, but in different ways. Next slide, please. And they're part of this Atlantico project. So in this first case study, um, we're conducting an Ocean Health Index within Galicia and um, we're conducting a full assessment. So that means that we're studying all 10 goals, although some assessments only focus on um, a subset of goals. But here I want to share with you some of the findings and some of the methods that we're using to understand sense of place within uh, the coastal area of Galicia. And so within the sense of place goal, there are actually two sub goals, and these are iconic species, which are species that are recognized as being uniquely important through the traditional activities that people have in relation to them. 
And the other sub goal is lasting special places. And these are the places that are, are valuable to people. And so we're attempting to understand how to measure the health of, of iconic species and lasting special places in Galicia. So next slide, please. So looking at iconic coastal species then, um, the way that we have gone about this is uh, a traditional way. That means that we're building on the methods that have been used in previous assessments. Um, but we were required here to develop some of our own data sets. So in Galicia, there wasn't uh, prior to this an existing list of iconic species for the coastal area. In some countries there are, um, often NGOs produce lists of iconic species because they're very helpful for um, public campaigns, for raising conservation awareness and for um, uh, various different uses. But um, within Galicia, we didn't have this list. So what we did was we uh, did a couple of different things. We looked at our major local newspaper and reviewed all of the species that were mentioned in newspaper articles over the last five years or so. And building on that, we came up with a, a subset of the most commonly mentioned species. And then we also worked with WWF in Spain to understand their interests and which species were important to them. And between these two sources and a much discussion, we identified uh, a list of these 20 iconic species, which um, we're now promoting as uh, uh, the iconic species for Galicia. And so um, we were also assessing the IUCN extinction risk, which is part of the OHI assessment as well. And so you can see in brackets there, the status. So EN means endangered, VU is vulnerable, LC least concern, DD data deficient, and NT not threatened, uh, CE critically endangered. So we have a, a whole range of um, extinction risks there within the species in our, in our list. And the reference point for the OHI is that all of these species should have the IUC and, and risk of least concern. So you can understand that for several of these species, um, there needs to be a lot of, of uh, work uh, put into them to to uh, improve their status and also for for example the orca which is data deficient there need to be studies conducted in the area and the long-finned pilot whale to understand what their status is um, so this is very helpful for uh, giving us some indication of what our priorities could be um, in terms of focusing conservation investment uh, in uh, threatened species uh, next slide, please. And then the other part of the sense of place goal is lasting special places. And for this goal, we're looking at marine protected areas along the coastline. And so according to the OHI, these are the, which is the Ocean Health Index, the marine protected areas um, are relevant when uh, the area that's relevant is one kilometer inland and three nautical miles offshore. So we're measuring the extent of coastline within that boundary that's already protected. And those can be um, under the different types of protections that are listed there, which we've gathered from the World Database of Protected Areas. So OSPARs, MPAs, um, Birds and Habitats Directive, Natura 2000, and Ramsar protected websites. And the aims um, for this goal is that 30% of the coastline should be protected. Next slide, please. And so we're still working on collecting this data. Um, so I don't have any specific results for Galicia to show to you today, but um, as part of the most recent global assessment, you can look at individual country assessments. And so we can look at Spain here. And what you're seeing here in the middle is the overall score for Spain of 77, which means that uh, there's some way to go for Spain to uh, achieve the ideal uh, level of health that um, this uh, type of analysis can, can show. And so you can see, for example, on the left, uh, where the, the green uh, petal, uh, which shows 86, um, that one's sense of place. 
the one on the right, 96, is natural products. And the one that shows 98 is coastal protection. So actually, Spain is doing quite well in terms of uh, protecting the, the coastal areas. However, the petal that has 66 there is tourism and recreation. And so clearly, there's there are some interactions here that need to be uh, monitored and managed. And this is really a very interesting way of looking at uh, all of the different interests which may be involved in a marine protected area because it helps you to understand how they, um, what at what status they are, um, where to invest, and what um, kind of interactions to to be careful uh, of of monitoring and managing, and which kinds of stakeholders as well to work with. And so the the dial on the right shows that. The overall ocean health index score for Spain is 77 out of 100, which is higher than the global average score of 73. So um, that's also quite helpful for policymakers to understand where we may be at the global level. However, um, certainly it's uh, not, uh, there's still some work to go and uh, certainly not a um, a reason to be able to to sit back. Um, we still have much work to do. So next slide, please. The second case study that I'd like to share with you is also from the Atlantico project. And here we've been uh, gathering iconic sites at the Atlantic level. So we have identified 25 different sites, which are all around the Atlantic coastline, and they include uh, coastal areas, islands, and also uh, sites in the high seas. And so most of these are a, a mix, but um, most are marine protected areas of some sort. So there are uh, MPAs, which are classified as MPAs. There are World Heritage Sites. There are Ramsar Sites and National Parks. And also we have three sites, which are tourism sites, which don't have formal management in place, whereas the protected areas do all have management plans. And so when we were selecting these sites, we had a number of criteria which we used um, because of the methods that we wanted to use to analyze the, the data and the data that we wanted to collect. So the sites need to be comparable and also they need to have a minimum amount of, of data available. And the way that we're uh, analyzing the, the cultural values and the social values of these sites is through Google Map reviews. So we needed a minimum of at least 200 Google Map reviews for each site to be able to have enough data to, uh, to compare attributes across different sites. And next slide, please. And so when we're talking about cultural ecosystem services, this is a framework developed by Fish and colleagues uh, it's one of the frameworks that we're using to analyze the data. But this is a, a really nice framework because it allows you to see the interactions between the different elements of uh, cultural ecosystem services. So, so these are the services that uh, contributions uh, of ecosystems to human well-being. And they include the identities that help. They help to frame the experiences they help to enable and the capabilities they help to equip. And so at the top of the diagram, the biophysical domain, in our case, is the ocean. And this is linked directly through cultural ecosystem services to environmental spaces on the left, which are the places where people are interacting with the ocean. And these shape and enable the cultural practices that people can do uh, in relation to the ocean. And so these are uh, categorized here as playing and exercising, which is things like um, sports, but also walking, looking, listening, um, creating and expressing relates to uh, activities such as photography or the artistic um, kinds of activities. Producing and caring is more to do with, um, so producing is more like fishing and um, food production and caring is uh, about environmental stewardship and protection. And then gathering and consuming is uh, relates to consumption of foods which are locally provenanced, but also consuming um, different types of media, such as artworks. And so these um, then shape and enable the kinds of ecosystem benefits that can be derived. And so the quality and the, the health of the ecosystem will have a, a direct impact 
on the kinds of identities, experiences and capabilities that people can have as a benefit from their interactions with the ocean. And next slide, please. So here I'm going to talk about the Abrolhos Marine National Park, which is one of the sites that we're studying. And so we uh, have directly downloaded data, the, the Google Maps reviews from Google Maps, which is freely accessible data. There are now limitations to using data from Instagram and other social media uh, platforms, which makes it more difficult to, to actually use that data nowadays. Whereas with Google Maps, the data is free. So you can go to this site, you can go and, uh, and look up the Abrolhos Marine National Park and see exactly the same data that we're using for, um, for this analysis. And so you can see here that um, there are 238 reviews and an average of 4.8 uh, rating. And some of the key terms that are coming up are things like diving, experience, humpback whales, coral, fish, catamaran, archipelago, fantastico. So this gives you an idea of the, the types of things that people are doing in this area. The next slide, please. So when we started looking at the cultural practices uh, from the, the reviews themselves, and uh, I've been pulling out this data, um, so people have been talking about going sailing, diving, photography, interacting with marine life and going walking. And I have to say, it's been a real pleasure reading these comments because the vast majority have been so positive and enthusiastic that I, I really have to go now <laughs> to this site and visit it. But um, some of the things they've been saying are just to see the whales in their natural habitat is magical and may the preservation of this place continue. So this, this relates to both playing and exercising and producing and caring types of practices. Although you, um, it's quite interesting that uh, a lot of people talked about uh, going on long boat journeys. And so uh, it's interesting. One of the negative comments was that it's only for people who don't have seasickness. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to look at this kind of data because it gives you a real idea of the profile of the place and about what's important to people. Next slide, please. So then looking at identities, uh, people have been saying that it's a place that's for marine life lovers and it's, that it's a spectacle and also that it's a Brazilian paradise. So uh, many people use the word paradise. Um, Brazilian, of course, direct ties directly to the culture of Brazil, um, which is a very nice representation of cultural identity. And next slide, please. So here we are looking at responses that can be related to the 10 Ocean Health Index goals. And you can see that most of the comments, I guess, as you would expect, relate to sense of place and tourism and recreation. Also, people were mentioning a lot about the biodiversity. And this was quite unique for this site. Uh, a number of the other sites that I've been looking at, for example, barely mentioned biodiversity because they're not encountering biodiversity there. But here it was a really important aspect of this of this place. And also clean waters. Uh, people are mentioning how, how clear the water is, how beautiful the water is. Um, there's a negative there against livelihoods and economies because there is a cost to going there. Um, clearly, you, if you want to go diving in this place or to take a boat trip, a lot of people talked about going on their own boats, then you do need, do need to have resources to be able to take part. And so that's very interesting for us to know. Um, and I'll tell you what, what we're going to do with this data in a, in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. And, and here you can see by the exclamation marks just how enthusiastic people are. And it really draws out the emotion that people feel about this place. Um, a must for those who worship nature. This ties into spirituality. And I love the trip. I intend to return in future. Um, there's a lot of uh, love or affection or gratitude that was expressed. Aesthetic pleasure, of course, about how beautiful the place is. And also curiosity. So it's a place to go if you if you really want variety and um, you're curious and you want to learn. And next slide, please. So here, uh, capabilities. Some people mentioned that it's a place where you can dive and discover the rich marine fauna. So you can learn, you can go to this place and you can learn new things. You can develop new skills or, or advance your current skills. And, and other people talked about um, learning about the history of the place as well from the researchers 
who are in the park. So we're, we're able to, to understand a diversity of different interests from just this, this is a very small snapshot of the comments that have been posted, but um, I think that they, they help to give you a, an idea of, well, how do you start to then incorporate these different interests into the management of this park? So if we can go to the uh, next slide, please. So our next steps are then to look at the management plan and to uh, identify what the specific management objectives are in terms of the conservation of the area, but also in terms of their interactions with tourism, because clearly this tourism needs to be managed if it's going to uh, continue as a spectacular place where you can go and visit uh, and see whales and, uh, and have this amazing time. So our next plan is to to work through the, the management plans for each of the sites and then see where there are um, coherent overlaps or if there are gaps that are missing or perhaps even conflicts between management objectives and what's of interest to the to the tourists who are visiting them. And um, these tourists can be from overseas, but they can also be local tourists. They can also be lo local residents who are uh, leaving comments. So there's a sector of, uh, of the public, uh, different sectors of the public, which are... Uh, interacting here with the place and also leaving comments. And we're um, aiming to be able to provide some guidelines to management, to the, the park managers through this process, and to not only understand what kinds of values are of interest to people, but also how, how can that contribute to improve management of the parks themselves. And uh, next slide. And so to, to summarize then, um, what we've found from our research is that the current management systems haven't often been able to deal with the global pressures that are undermining marine biodiversity because there are uh, many pressures and there are many different types of pressures that we don't necessarily have data for or we don't understand sufficiently or we don't understand how they interact. And so in this context, Marine protected areas have become one of the most used spatial management tools to both reduce biodiversity loss and increase nature's contributions to people. And so it's really essential that we better design future MPAs and MPA networks so that we can improve the conservation status of marine ecosystems, not just for, for biodiversity, but also for human well-being. And to ensure that we are um, addressing human well-being as well, then this objective of uh, better designing parks needs to be aligned and protected areas needs to be aligned with attention to the needs and visions of local stakeholders and the inclusion of plural values is, is absolutely essential. And so next slide, please, we have um, some policy recommendations based on our work, which um, first of all is in the context of a transformative change which uh, needs to advance from the current state of the art about the role of MPAs in delivering marine ecosystem services. And so we have identified some practical solutions to, to help with this transformative change and that can ensure both social sustainability and equity of people and coastal communities uh, so that their interests are not um, left out. And so these involve improving the collection of interdisciplinary data on ecosystem services, so including the social sciences in um, assessments of marine protected areas, but also of non-protected areas, uh, areas that may become MPAs, and also integrating the sustainability and the social equity of MPAs into decision-making processes. And I know there's a lot of work that's being done now to identify social indicators and to better understand how we can go about doing this. And so this needs to, to continue and develop further. And our third recommendation is to increase the enforcement of MPAs and the participation of local communities, because it's the local communities who are possibly most invested in, in contributing and who benefit uh, directly as well on a more regular basis, and um, also are very committed often to uh, protecting their local areas. And I think that was our last slide. Yes, so it just remains for me to say thank you and to ask if there are any questions. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jill and Sebastian. This was a fantastic presentation and we are so grateful you were, were willing to come today and share all this work. 
Um, we do have questions and we will be able to get to a couple of them before the end of the hour. Um, we're gonna start with one that came in. Could you expand upon the relationship between MPAs and the different credits that can generate revenue stream for projects, um, such as blue water credits, carbon credits, biodiversity credits, et cetera? Uh, I think I might ask Sebastian if he has an answer to that one. Well, I do not have an answer to that one because I would say that <laughs> because I would say that this is a really good question. Thanks for asking. Uh, this is really interesting, and uh, uh, and indeed, I would say that well, for for some of the uh, MPAs uh, in different places, uh, maybe this this type of instrument or tool could be a good way to try to. Uh, use in, in order to stimulate or to motivate or to incentive basically uh, local actors to really be engaged and to effectively manage uh, the marine protect areas. But uh, I will say that as, as far as uh, we know from the uh, experience that we have been working in, in some of these uh, cases, uh, which are really uh, low in, in our case until now, but we are working in, for example, in this Equal C project, we are working right now in, in about uh, 25, 30 uh, marine protect areas around the world in order to measure equity, uh, ocean equity, both social uh, equity, but also ecological sustainability. And this is one of the instruments that we, we are right now uh, trying to, uh, let's say, uh, examine or, or analyze when present, right? So uh, I will not have a, a, a final answer on that, honestly. Uh, but uh, this is something that I will say that needs to be uh, carefully uh, reviewed and analyzed case by case, I would say. Okay, thank you both. Um, another question that came in, um, many of the types of MPAs that were listed, Natura 2000, Habitats Directives, SPAs, et cetera, still allow activities such as bottom trawling, development of offshore wind, cable laying, et cetera. How is this taken into account when giving a score for a country region? Will the score be lower if their MPAs still allow certain damaging activities, or does the assessment not go into that level of detail? It must be a monumental task to assess what activities are permitted and prohibited in coastal MPAs. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. And in fact, the the way that the uh, the data assessment works for the for the OHI is that there are um, a number of different data layers which can um, be used to inform each goal. And so if you go onto the Ocean Health Index website, you can look at what those data layers are. And there are um, layers for specifically for um, uh, impacts of different types of fishing. And so that could be incorporated. If you have uh, bottom trawling in your area that you need to assess, then there, there will be impacts from that, which could be measured through some of the different data layers. And um, there are also, so there are ecological data layers and social data layers and biological data layers. And through the combination, depending on what data, data and circumstances you have in your area, then you can tailor the type of assessment that you want to do. And so it is very flexible in that way. And um, and does allow you to incorporate different kinds of interests. So Thank I would you. encourage you to go to the the website to have a look at the data layers. Okay, wonderful. Thank you both. Um, another question: Could you elaborate on the concept of social cohesion as a value of the ocean? Hmm. Yes. So I would um, I would say that social cohesion, one way that um, in the past that I've been able to explore this kind of thing is through understanding people's shared values. And I think this is a really good place to start, um, especially when you have a number of different interests, because I think with social cohesion, what you're trying to achieve is um, agreement and, um, and buy-in and support for particular actions. And often, um, for example, if there are uh, places where if you have a, a, a conflict, for example, between different stakeholders, the, um, the stakeholders may actually have um, the same goal for a, for a place. They may want, for example, or they may want to conserve a species, but they want to go about it in different ways. And this is where the conflict arises from. I think with social cohesion, it's um, 
it's about understanding where those shared values are and using that as a starting point and um and moving from there so you can do that through um through uh, uh, asking people directly what their interests are and their their attitudes towards a particular issue and then seeing where there are similarities and differences and trying when you're trying to understand the differences and whether uh, see whether these can be surmounted so this is a very i'm talking of i suppose from a very methodological approach to how how i have worked on this in the past um sebastian i don't know if you want to to add anything there from your experience not not maybe directly tackling that but i see that uh, sorry sarah that i know that we we are just one minute past uh, the time uh, but uh, there I, I am just started to read all of the questions and comments that are really really useful but trying to talk uh, to address this comment in relation to some of the comments that they are more related to justice or or equity and so on uh, that, that uh, well all of the, the, the colleagues that are highlighted that that it is true this particular let's say ocean health index is not explicitly uh let's say measuring uh or monitoring justice problems that uh, this is why uh, we are not able right now to provide a, a results still but in in this uh, uh, equal C project what we are uh, measuring is uh the uh, the the equity of explicit marine protect area right so we explicitly develop a specific index to measure ocean equity for marine protect areas including the justice problem right by considering distributional procedural contextual and management equity right i hope this uh, i know that we are at the end of a webinar but uh, in our website and in our uh, social network we will be start to publish in some results by the end or or, or in the next uh, trimester of the next year uh, which uh, include this specific aspect of uh, equity for marine protect areas itself. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sebastian and Jill. Um, and thank you to everyone who was able to attend. There were a lot of really great questions we were not able to get to. Um, I will be providing those to Sebastian and Jill and um, so that they are able to see them. Um, Thank you everyone for attending and uh, this may be a topic we can follow up on in the future because there's a lot of great questions we were not able to get to unfortunately um again thank you for coming um and we hope to see you all in future webinars and sebastian and jill thank you again for, for making the time and for preparing this presentation thank you so our, much our pleasure and i at your disposal to have any conversation or respond in any question by email and so on more than happy jill and me thank you so much yes Yes, me too. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Fantastic. And um, if anybody wants to be put in touch with Sebastian and Jill, you can um, email me and I, I can I can put you in touch and give you their emails. Um, I'm Sarah at octogroup.org and uh, you should have my email from all the many web uh, emails I send regularly. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.